like to think it went on sabbatical to come back even better and brighter. Uh, this is our first um, speaker of the series, but we do have fairly regular speakers, so I encourage you, if you're not already signed up on our mailing list, to do so, so you can keep on top of all the great speakers we have in the coming weeks, and also we'll start up again in the fall. Uh, this seminar series is sponsored by the Science Institute, the Data Lab, Interactive Data Lab. Anyway, um, one thing I want to highlight is that I'm going to be circulating this sign-up sheet. This is um, an opportunity for us uh, both to get a feel for how, what the breadth is of, of individuals that are interested in our seminar series, but it's also a, a nice opportunity for us to highlight um, the interest in the seminar series so we can make a pitch for continued funding. Uh, there's a place for your name and department, but also your email address, and the email address is optional. If you do put it in there, we will add you to the mailing list if you're not already on it. I think that's it. So now I'm going to introduce the person who will introduce our speaker, and that is Ariel Rocha, one of our data scientists at the eScience Institute. If you haven't visited us, we're on the sixth floor of the Physicist London Tower. Please stop by. Okay, and it's a pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dana Boyd. Uh, she's a principal uh, researcher at uh, Microsoft Research and also the founder and president of Data and Society and a visiting professor at NYU. Uh, she has a, a PhD in information from uh, UC Berkeley and uh, a degree in computer science from Brown University. Uh, she's really been uh, one of the pioneers of thinking about um, how data science affects people, how people affect data science and the complications that come with that. Um, and I imagine that she has to update her slides on a fairly regular basis. Um, and she'll be talking about vulnerability in this vulnerabilities in a socio-technical society. Please welcome Dana Boyd. Thank you. It's great to be with you today. I'm really excited, so thank you all for coming out. Hopefully I, our talk today is going to be a little fun and we'll have a conversation afterwards. I'm going to do my best not to scare people, but people have warned me that this talk is a little scary, so I'm going to apologize in advance for that. Um, the talk I want to give today is about what's happening uh, in terms of what we normally call big data or AI. I have to start by explaining what those terms mean because they don't mean what anybody in a technical field might think they should mean. Um, big data at this point has nothing to do with bigness and rarely has anything really to do with data. It's a mythology. Um, it's the idea that if we just get more data, more information, we know more, we give computers more, that we will suddenly be able to solve all of the intractable problems in the rest of society. Um, and needless to say, this doesn't always work out so well. Um, and this was very much propelled by a set of um, political actors and economic actors uh, you know, throughout the better part of the last 10 years because of the idea of, in many ways, fetishizing technology. And I say this because for anybody who actually does data science, um, who actually does data analytics of any form, what big data has become within popular discourse looks really alien. But that's even more true of what's happened to AI within popular discourse. Um, AI at this point is, was actually moved, moved into big data because big data within a lot of conversations um, in the political realm became big brother. And so people just started substituting the same practices by calling it AI. Um, and that basically was you know, trying to signal the idea of smart machines. Um, but it really takes on in the public discourse any time a computer seems to do something that the public can't understand, um, which I think is really fascinating. And as I was trying to interrogate why we were using this language, I talked to an executive from a major company. I was like, why is it that everyone is so obsessed with AI in this strange form that I don't recognize? And they're like, well, who would want natural stupidity? So that's basically the juxtaposition upon which AI has become. The reason I start there is that you will see a lot of slippage in this conversation about what we mean when we're talking about data analytics, data science, big data, AI. And that's intentional because that slippage has become part of the broader discourse. Now, much of what has been centered around this current scope of conversations that we'll talk about is really about the data that involves people. And I say this because anybody who's done really sophisticated machine learning or data analytics knows that a lot of data that we work with doesn't involve people. Um, and when I say it involves people, it's not just data um, given to us by people, but data that will affect people. 
And that is where the frothiness has really come at the center of things. Um, and that dynamic has really come into fold and made very visible because of the rise of social media. Not all data analytics involving people involve social media data, but there's a lot of things that got moved around as part of the public discourse. And obviously, this last week has been surely interesting um, in how people feel about that. And we can go into that some in the Q&A. Now, part of what I want to anchor is that you know, when we think about data analytics, there's a wide range of, of practices that are involved. Some we think of as inherently positive. And I want to anchor that because I think it's important to acknowledge that those practices that we think of as inherently positive usually start with an end goal that we collectively agree upon as part of a society. So generally speaking, you are hard pressed to find somebody who says, I don't think that a cure for cancer is a good idea. Right? Most of the time, people say trying to succeed in advances in medicine or in healthcare or human wellness is generally assumed to be a positive end goal. And then what's at stake is what it takes to get there, right? So we may not like abuses or manipulations of data that are used. We can look back to the Nazi experiments, to Tuskegee, to these examples where our pursuit of knowledge about medicine has been corrosive. But generally speaking, we think at do, like pursuing medicine with data analytics processes is a really positive thing. And I want to anchor that on one end of the spectrum and put another one in place which is criminal justice. At the end of the day, we don't actually agree on what the purpose of criminal justice is. And that's actually a really fraught domain, both domestically and abroad. And I'm going to give you two very extreme possible end goals of, uh, of criminal justice to make that visible. For some, criminal justice is fundamentally a punitive exercise to punish individual bad apples who have done something wrong by society and to find and identify those bad people that should then be punished. That is one view that often has a certain uh, subscription uh, to for a lot of people. On a very opposite end of the spectrum, we can talk about criminal justice as a moment in which we see social failure we see a, a question of when criminal justice needs to identify an opportunity for restorative inter interactions, restorative justice, this way of saying that some people's behaviors, because of a configuration of a variety of, of um, social factors, do not align with what we think of as generally positive. And then the intervention is one of society, not one of individuals. And I've laid this out in a way to make it very clear that when we talk about data analytics in criminal justice, a lot depends on what we value as the end goal. If you believe that the project of criminal justice is punitive, modes like predictive policing or risk assessment scores start to line up very cleanly. If you believe in a restorative approach to justice, if you believe in the idea that individuals have a way of actually being integrated more broadly back in society, that punitive mode and that data analytics that do that are fundamentally unjust. Right? So I'm going to lay those out and we'll come back to that. But the reason I want to anchor this is as we talk around this space, I want you to keep in mind that there is nothing neutral about any part of this process. And it's a lot about thinking about where the techniques that we build are situated within this broad social ecosystem. I love this quote. This quote gives me such warm, fuzzy feelings. Um, Jeff Bowker argued now over a decade ago that we can't just look at data as though it is a scientific process. And he argued that raw data is both an oxymoron and a bad idea. To the contrary, data should be cooked with care, which is just a beautiful image. But what he's pointing out in this process is that we can't just see data as it's sitting there. We need to understand it within a broader set of social conf configurations. And once you do, you start to realize that the interventions across that data become different. Okay. I'm going to put that as the sort of orienting place. And now we're going to go um, sort of back down deep and ask where we got this data in the first place. Because a lot of what we have to contend with is the steps by which we make sense of data uh, across it and the ethical considerations. Now, I'll start by saying, how did we get data about people or affects people, mostly data that's produced by people? Where does it come from? And I like to think about this in terms of data by choice, circumstance, and coercion. Um, data by choice is the idea that in an ideal world, you have made a relationship with a person who has produced that data, 
They have read every aspect of the terms of service and they know why they've shared that data with you. They believe that that trade-off is wonderful and uh, beneficial to them. There's a moment where we can see the opportunities. The fascinating thing about the early days of tech sector is that most people exchanged their data with various companies because those companies were created by their friends. They knew them, they trusted them, they believed in that exchange was mutually productive. That is the ideal vision that many um, technical actors hope that they can uh, create, a moment where that trade-off is mutually beneficial. That is data by choice. That is the ideal that we all aim for. On the opposite end of the spectrum, there are the practices of coercion that are extremely horrible. Right? And these are the ones where we look at, at a totally different end of the spectrum that makes people super anxious. Um, how many of you are familiar with the spit and a quit programs down in California? These are my favorite horrible practices. Um, I love collecting horrible practices. Um, this all comes down to a Supreme Court ruling called Maryland versus King that ruled that collecting um, genetic material, DNA, at the point of arrest was equivalent to collecting a photograph or a fingerprint. Clearly, the justices failed to take biology in high school um, because they saw these things as just a unique identifier of a person. So what happened as this unfolded after this ruling is that many different police uh, units started experimenting with ways of collecting genetic material about people within their um, jurisdiction. And Orange County put out probably the most interesting and horrible version of this, which is that then when they were in the process of um, possibly deciding whether or not to arrest somebody, usually for a low-level crime, they would make deals. So they would basically say to them, spit, provide your genetic material, and there would be an acquittal. You wouldn't be charged. And that's how they actually amassed a tremendously large data set of genetic material. And you can imagine how wonderful it was when people started showing, law enforcement started showing up to people's doors being like, I really want to find your brother because he's wanted for arrest. And people would be like, yeah, didn't know I had a brother. That's a little awkward. Right? So this is an extreme end of the spectrum because this is both um, classically coercive in that you know, it was coerced by an individual under a particular uh, you know, assertion of power, but it is also coercive within the network, which is that the data that is acquired not just about the individual but about their network comes into play. I'm sure it doesn't take uh, two seconds to realize um, the demographics of much of that data and the very abusive practices that uh, unfolded accordingly. Now, those are two ends, right? We've got choice on one end, we've got coercion on another end, and in a lot of political conversations about data, we assume one or the other, right? Some people are like, it's all choice. We can make everything all choice. And some people say it's all coercive. The stark reality is that most data that we work with is by circumstance. It's a matter that you're on Instagram, you want to hang out with your friends, you really don't want to know what Facebook is doing with that data, it's better not to know, and you just hope that the company is going to be good to you. That is the culture of data by circumstance. And it's interesting because in American society and legal jurisprudence, we have a lot of assumptions that if you've left data behind, if that, that circumstantial data is fair game for the public. So all of you are now sitting in seats. Most likely you have left behind a lot of genetic material um, just by going like this. And according to the law, I can collect any of that data because you have left it as property that you're not invested in. Right? You can imagine the fun that happens when we talk about art around this. That is a lot of sort of the dynamic that we've got about data by circumstance. It's just out there. We really hope it won't come back to bite us. Um, and it's part of the broader ecosystem. And that's when we get into a lot of different questions about what are the ethics or responsibilities that we have around that data? Whose data is that? What are the implications? What are the you know, dynamics at play? OK, so that's part one. Part two, the next thing we have to do is try to make sense of a lot of the data that we're working with. right? I mean, that is fundamentally the product of um, data analytics. And the thing that I like to remind ourselves of is that the first thing that we do analytically is engage in the act of discrimination. Now, if I say the word discrimination to you in 2018 in the United States, my guess is that you immediately conjure up an association with uh, an assertion of power over a population as a mechanism of discrimination, right? Racial discrimination, sex-based discrimination, et cetera. That is what that word means in everyday vernacular at this point. But fundamentally, the act of discrimination is to segment 
data in a particular way. And we do this all the time when we do you know, different work. When we're talking about how we're going to do you know, min cuts across graphs. When we think about how we're going to you know, separate out our data in particular ways. We have to act in a way to discriminate across different uh, parts of properties or features of that data. The question at play is not whether or not we do that but whether we do that in a way that actually brings back into us all the different issues of power that at play. And so let's talk about some of these examples. I will begin with my favorite apocryphal, heightened, insane example because it's just so much fun to work with. How many of you are familiar with the target example? Good, you've clearly been reading the news and a variety of other things. Now the reason why I like this example um, is not because it's necessarily true. In fact, we're not actually sure that it is. But let me explain it for those who are unfamiliar. First thing to know is that when someone is pregnant, they change their consumer practices for life. It's a very critical point for all marketers. And marketers have long tried to gather data to identify when somebody is pregnant in order to target them or when they first had a child. They use public records. Um, if any of you have had children, you know you actually have to register them um, uh, as a part of a public records, it is amazing. It's like, wait six weeks and here come the adverts, right? Like that is part of the process. Now, marketers have long figured out that we can backwards that data. So they've learned that um, another record that is generally within the public is marriage records. And depending on crossing marriage records with zip code, you can get a decent idea of the likelihood of when somebody will have their first child um, after marriage. And that's been used for years in different ways. Um, and so when Facebook first came out, one of the things that they made a lot easier was to get much closer to that cross between marriage, which you would announce on your Facebook in a lovely way, and the likelihood based on your network structure about when you were going to have a ch child. Well, Target was even smarter than that. Target figured out that they could work back from their own data about what were the trends of what people were doing nine months before they purchased um, uh, diapers, right? And it's pretty easy to do because you've gotten one of those cards, and enough of the population has gotten one of those cards that they could go back. And they worked out that people were buying unscented hand lotion and vitamins, which is fascinating. And so they pulled forward and um, provided advertisements to people that they predicted with high levels of accuracy were probably pregnant. And as the story goes in the New York Times, one of the recipients of those ads was a 16-year-old girl who apparently her father was quite irate and called the store. If you ever try to call the store, you're not going to get a senior person at the store. So the person at the other end was like, ah, yeah, I'll have somebody call you back. And as the story goes, the manager calls them back, and the father says to the manager, there are things happening in my household that I didn't know about. In other words, as the story goes, the um, target learned that this girl was pregnant before uh, her father does. And again, pin, I don't know whether or not this story is true. But this story was huge. And Target's response to it was very interesting. They didn't backpedal and say, we're no longer going to deal with sensitive areas. They purposefully put out content that was misleading alongside content that they predicted to be true. I live in the center of Manhattan. I got lawn mowing ads. I can promise you I don't need a lawn mower. Right? That's a really interesting response to a creepy dynamic. Right? which is when you have accurate data, do you think about whether or not working with that data is problematic, or do you try to obscure the likelihood that you're accurate? Now, sometimes the data analytics that are done um, happen in ways that are kind of confusing and unpredictable, and we're not sure what's happening. And I love recommendation engines for this. Mike Anani is a professor at USC. Um, and he was downloading um, Grindr on his Android phone when he noticed um, that he was getting recommended um, for the next possible service he might want as a sex offender search. And he scratched his head. For those who aren't familiar with Grindr, it's a, um, a location-based app for uh, primarily gay men um, interested in meeting other gay men. And so he was like, hmm, sex offender search. For those, again, for unfamiliar with um, prejudicial American um, attitudes, there's an assumption that gay men in this country must be sex offenders um, that has been propagated for a very long time in a homophobic way. And so he thought this was a strange connection. He wrote a piece um, in The Atlantic genuinely asking, how did this happen? Was there something within the system that meant it was the same zip code? Is, is that, was that the trigger? Was there something about the content? That would be strange. Was there something about the user base? That'd be fascinating and weird. What was it that made this a recommendation? 
Now, what's fascinating here is that he never found out because uh, Google responded to this by simply removing the correlation. Um, so he never got an explanation. But it's this interesting moment that happens in, you know, in a lot of recommendation structures. Something could just be totally random as the connection, or it could have meaning. But we don't know. But at a cultural level, when we see that connection made, we make meaning out of that connection. We think there is something really there, something nefarious going on. And that's important because the technical system has no idea why these things might be politically fraught. Right? They don't have a sense of meaning across this. But as viewers to this, we ascribe meaning to these connections. And that makes these analytic projects very difficult because sometimes it's random, sometimes it has intention. And sometimes it's about automating the practices that are underpinning a lot of other social factors. So Latanya Sweeney is a uh, computer scientist at Harvard, um, and she, uh, you know, was she's done a lot of interesting experiments in her life. And she was sitting down, explaining to a journalist one of her previous experiments, and was trying to bring up um, the paper she had written. And so she searched for her own name on Google. And the journalist was really fascinated by the advertisements that were associated with her name, which she had never really noticed before, because many of them were associated with criminal justice products. They were asking if LaTanya had an arrest record. LaTanya's like, I do not have an arrest record. I've done a lot of things, but I do not have an arrest record. Um, and uh, she was sort of fascinated to understand why. So she went in and she took uh, historic baby names. Um, these are there are baby name databases associated um, by a bunch of different features, including um, uh, sex, including race across time. So she took contemporary baby names predominantly associated with black and African American um, uh, children and baby names that were predominantly associated with American white children. And she decided to run a script to see what would happen with the, the ads. And what came back to her was really fascinating because what she saw was that there, was a, there were a couple of companies that had clearly produced about six ads um, that um, basically targeted all of these baby names, but they rotated and they shifted about whether they were asking people if they had been arrested or whether they just wanted background checks. And not surprisingly, the association had something to, was, was correlated strongly to the um, racial characteristics of those uh, baby names. Now, Latanya knows enough about Google to know that Google did not sell on the racial properties of those names. They sold on names. So in other words, this company had bid on names. So how did we get this separation? What had happened was that users who were searching for names were clicking on an ad or not ad. And basically, they were more likely to click on an ad associated um, with a prejudicial stereotype uh, when they were when they were clicking on an African American or searching for an African American or black name, and the result is that they taught Google how to segment those names. In other words, they taught Google how to be part of a racist American society and to reinforce that. And then Google, conveniently, propelled it back down at all of us. Again, there was nothing within the system that understood the racial features of this. You have to actually program the system to resist those racial categorizations. Um, without that, they will reinforce all sorts of prejudices within society. It's also generally a problem when we start to do this kind of data analytics that it's hard to figure out where the voids in our data landscape are. So, Michael Golbieski, who, is a, um, who works on Bing across the, uh, the water here, in Microsoft, he's been interested in what are referred to as data voids. Now, data voids are the space within search for which there is no legitimate or good high quality content. Okay? So people do not write an article of did the Holocaust happen when they mean well. Right? That's not an article that you know, the Anti-Defamation League would by default produce. And the result is, is that even when you get people to clean up the first couple of queries by trying to explain Holocaust denial on Wikipedia, it takes you about four um, links in to see nothing but pretty horrific um, Holocaust denial content. The same is true of white pride. This is not something that people produce with a, predict, um, a productive conversation around race in America. It comes from a very strong um, uh, racist perspective. So, of course, the second link is uh, a very well-known white nationalist, white supremacist organization. So this is where we get these interesting challenges here because 
the ranking of the data within these kinds of queries is problematic because the data available associated with them is problematic. Those are data voids. I want you to hold on to that because we're going to come back to these pieces. Part three, what happens when we start to see people explicitly corrupting the data? The reason I want to bring this up is we often have conversations about implicit dynamics of the data, and we'll come back to some of those. But I want to talk about explicit abuses of the data, ways in which people work to try to undermine the quality of data that is available for a variety of analytics. And a lot of times it starts with a moment of fun. I've been studying social media since pretty early on in the days of social media. So this is a story from when MySpace was a really cool thing. Many people may not know MySpace. It's a precursor to Facebook. Um, it was a very, very, very popular tool for a while. And at the time, people were very excited by the idea of friending. And the idea that somebody could have a lot of friends was a really important thing. So I was brought onto a marketing panel. I knew nothing about marketing, so I didn't know why I was on this panel. Um, but I was on this marketing panel, and I was really confused by it. And I was on there with a representative from Coca-Cola, who was proudly proclaiming that they were the most beloved um, uh, product, uh, you know, basically consumer product uh, uh, character on MySpace, and that everybody loved them, and that they had the most friends. I burst out laughing. Not a good thing to do on a panel. And the moderator looks at me and says, why do you think this is so funny? And I was like, I had noticed how extraordinarily popular Coca-Cola was. And I hate to break it to the rep, but that's not the Coke people are referring to. <laughs> In other words, people had used the reference to Coca-Cola to make a particular statement about uh, different substances. And the representative didn't know this and was quite embarrassed. It's a moment in which people were messing with the data or using the system in a way that was really unpredicted by those who are looking at the data without any context. This is something that I love watching young people do for years. A um, couple of favorite examples of mine are um, uh, when people were trying to figure out the news feed on Facebook, when that was sort of a cool thing amongst young people, um, they were trying to figure out ways of making certain that their content was highly perceived um, by their friends. So they started putting in brand names um, and links to BuzzFeed articles, hoping that that would rank or overweight their content in a particular way. They were really delighted. It was fun. Needless to say, I don't think Nike thought that was why their name was being used in these services. Um, I also sat down in North Carolina with a group of teenagers, um, and I saw this uh, young boy. They were using um, Gmail, which is always sort of noticeable because young people don't use email. So I was like, why are you using Gmail? And he was like, oh, because everything else is blocked here, but this isn't because we're allowed to use Google Apps in school. I was like, OK. So uh, he's like writing to his friends you know, when he's clearly supposed to be doing his homework. And he writes a message, and then he scrolls down with a bunch of uh, return characters, and then, then starts to write a bunch of stuff, and then highlights it and selects it and makes it white, so it's white text on white background. I'm like, what are you doing? He's like, oh, it's funny. I was like, what's so funny? And what I'd worked out he was trying to do was mess with the ads on his friend's um, account when he sent them the email. Because like, if you're 15, getting your friends to get diapers ads is awesome, right? Again, not what I expected the advertisers thought they were seeing when they saw this kind of analytics. This is your main line. Let's just play with data because it's fun. Now, let's step it up a level. If you don't know what 4chan is, I recommend not looking it up. Um, but um, 4chan has long had a lot of fun um, with different kinds of actors. Um, in the upper left-hand corners, when Time Magazine arrogantly said that they could make a list of the most uh, important 100 people um, in the country world, I don't even remember, and 4chan was like, oh, we can pwn that. And Time Magazine said, we're smarter than you. And they managed to not only pwn the list, they managed to pwn the entire order of the list, which says marble cake, also the game. Again, if you don't know that reference, it's better not to. But the point is, is that they managed to mess with this for fun. You know, they, anything you have ranked is just to be messed with. Um, another great example, this is actually doesn't even require 4chan, um, is our, the bottom right. Uh, Santorum's back in the news um, in the last week, um, to my delight. He's my senator, always um, lovely, from Pennsylvania. And he had the nerve to say um, uh, over a decade ago that uh, homosexuality is equivalent to bestiality or pedophilia. Um, and Dan Savage decided that we would have to remember that for eternity. And so what happened was that people learned the beginnings of Google bombing. So they associated his name with, you can look it up. And um, 
uh, basically decided to link as much as possible to that and so sort of owned it, so which is really great. So when everybody was looking him up this week, they got right back to his last adventure. Um, he's, I, I don't know why he's allowed to be on TV. It's a terrible idea. Um, so these are sort of examples, and I watched young people sort of messing with these systems because they wanted to hack the attention economy. They wanted to play with things, and that was really fun. I watched a group of teenagers decide that they would um, try to redirect Oprah Winfrey to spend 45 minutes um, arguing that the greatest threat to young people is actually uh, a representative of a teddy bear named Pedo Bear, who represents all online sexual predators. Um, and she actually said on national TV that there were over 9,000 penises coming to rape our children. Needless to say, the internet went wild. It was really funny. Um, again, in jokes that are probably best not to look up. That was all fun and games. These were all ways of messing with large scale systems to mess with the media, to mess with the data tools, to try to find ways that they'd have fun with it. Well, it's gotten a little bit more political over the last couple of years. Um, on uh, November 5th, um, a uh, man walked into a church in Sutherland Springs, uh, Texas, and started shooting. Um, and I got the notice, like many people in this country, that there was an active shooting. And so I went on to forums that I know all too well just to see what the conversation would be and how long it would take for them to mess with the systems. Um, in these environments, uh, various white nationalists, white supremacists, and people associated with alt-right spent a lot of time trying to so associate any active shooter with um, Antifa if they're white or with ISIS or ISIL if they're not. Um, and the way in which they do this is by trying to mess with Reddit data and mess with Twitter data. Um, it took them, and they use that to try to shape Google's um, processes. It took them all of uh, 36 minutes to completely pwn Google, um, and it didn't take them long after to get major news media to actually cover um, with their conspiracy. Uh, what's fascinating about the Newsweek coverage is that um, folks within these environments know that the, um, uh, there's a character count on how Google News announces things that results in only the first six words uh, actually being present at the top of Google. So by the time most of you would have looked this up, you would have seen at the top of Google Antifa responsible for Sutherland Springs murders. This is a way of gaming with this data in order to particularly push a political ideology we can talk a lot about Cambridge Analytica um, as we go into questions. But there's a whole set of moves trying to strategically undermine and mess with the public data that people are pulling on in order to mess with the analytic systems that rely on that data. And these are long-standing processes in which people try to propagate. Anybody want to guess what the search query is? You got it. It's crisis actors. This has been built over multiple years now. It was built over Sandy Hook. The goal was to propagate it into the mainstream. You can't find a student from Parkland who doesn't have to defend that they are not a crisis actor on national TV at this point. Um, that was a way of propelling a particular conspiracy or frame. It was a term that was searchable for a long time that basically brought people down different rabbit holes, different ways of looking at deeply problematic content. I watched a lot of groups trying to um, test these things. Uh, let's explain Pizzagate. Um, so Pizzagate begins with John Podesta, who at the time uh, was helping Hillary Clinton uh, run her campaign. Um, this is 2016. And uh, what happened was that his emails had been fully pulled, most likely for a foreign adversary, and thrown into a vari variety of environments, including an amazing number of conspiracy theorists. People started diving into these emails and found that he was regularly referencing a particular pizza shop. Um, and so the conspiracy started to unfold. And actually, if you know anything about conspiracies, they always have roots in something real. Um, this one's hard for a lot of people outside of these environments to recognize. But um, anybody who comes from um, uh, Christian evangelical communities might recognize that before um, sex trafficking conversations were about the internet, they were about phone calls that used to happen. Um, and I say Christian evangelical communities because they were some of the most frontline folks fight, fighting sex trafficking in this country. Um, and so it was well established, and the feds used to focus on phone calls that were about ordering of pizza topics on a regular basis by certain actors. 
Um, so this was well known within certain communities that there was an association with pizza that goes back to the history of sex trafficking. People put this together who did not particularly like um, Clinton, and she had done a lot of work as Secretary of State on sex trafficking issues, um, believing that she was trying to um, cover up both for her husband's sexual infidelities and for the sexual um, proclivities of her AIDS um, uh, activities, or her AIDS husband's activities, otherwise known as Anthony Weiner. So it becomes a perfect storm in certain communities. This is a great conspiracy making. But what's interesting about Pizzagate is not that it was made within these environments. There's a lot of conspiracies that are made within these environments. Um, but what's interesting about this is that it was a test of the major media ecosystem. It was a test about whether or not we could actually see certain things play out. Um, so the CDC in, uh, in to early 2016 put out a report that the more that there is, um, the more the media reports on there being no correlation between autism and vaccination, the more the public believes there to be a correlation. It's known as the boomerang effect. Um, and so one of the things that you do when you think that people don't trust the media is you try to get the media to negate something. If the media negates it, more people will believe it is true. So it was a test. Hundreds of people showed up to that pizza shop to self-investigate. One showed up with a gun. Um, so this is how we now know about this case beyond um, these particular environments. This is a way of trying to mess with systems. And we can talk about a whole variety of other tests under our information system, a test onto our data infrastructure, because they're happening all around us. Um, it's also interesting, especially uh, you know, out here, where um, there's all these ways of looking at uh, broader ways of testing other kinds of data analytics that are happening. What's fascinating about this example, and this is a great paper, um, there's a whole world of adversarial machine learning that is actually trying to build mechanisms of seeing where the machine learning systems that we built might get undermined. So the reason why this paper is important is, um, I don't know about you, but I can't tell the difference between those two stop signs, right? But a neural net that does computer vision can. It reads one as a stop sign and the other as a yield sign. Just takes a few modifications of a pixel to undermine uh, a, uh, a learning system. So this is one of the reasons why they're starting to say, can we think adversarially from the get-go? The reason I bring this up is that as I was talking about some of these other kinds of uh, attacks on data systems, we need to be starting to integrate a security mindset into this. And we'll come back to that. Um, but my point is, is that there's a whole culture right now of data corruption. Folks who are very invested in a world in which data now has a tremendous amount of power, and when it has power, let's mess with it. Let's mess with that data so that we can actually introduce a whole set of dynamics into that system. Again, we can come back. All right, so let's back up. I can go darker. I'm going to resist going darker. I'm not going to go a little bit more positive. Um, say, why are we building data analytics systems in the first place? One of the reasons why is that we believe we can do good things. And almost everybody who builds you know, a sophisticated machine learning system or a different kind of, um, does different kind of data analytics imagines the positive things, right? You don't imagine the nefarious. And I'm a big believer of that. And that's one of the reasons that I've spent a lot of my life trying to do really good things with um, different aspects of data and science. So I'm going to tell you an ex example of where I think this works well. I'm on the board of Crisis Text Line. Um, crisis Text Line is a counseling service for people in crisis um, to be able to text with a trained counselor and receive a lot of support and feedback. Now, if anybody knows much about the mental health space, we've not invested a lot in this country in mental health. We, most mental health experts struggle to get a lot of support, both economically and in terms of peer environments. A, you know, a therapist is most likely to see 8, 10 patients a day, um, and only so many patients a month over a lifetime, et cetera. Right? And one of the biggest challenges there is how do you learn, like a medical practitioner in general, from all of the things that everybody else is learning? Right? How do you build up a broader repertoire, not just from the moment of reading about cases um, in school, but about through experiential knowledge? And it's really difficult when you have a narrow set of cases. So one of the things that we do at Crisis Text Line is we actually use a lot of data analytics to try to understand what works or doesn't work, what are the patterns that we can see between the counselors um, um, and the texters who are in crisis. And how do we then help all of the other counselors get better? Right? This is augmentation. The goal here is not automation. The goal is augmentation. How do we level up? as many counselors as possible by using the collective pool of knowledge to support each and every one of them. 
Now, the reason why I bring up augmentation is that augmentation works out really well in an environment like this. Everyone agrees that giving that counselor the best possible skills is phenomenal. Now, keep in mind, we send out active rescues, many active rescues every night for somebody who is in the middle of a suicide. We want to identify those people as fast as possible. We want to help the counselors do it. We want to make certain that this is as humanistic as possible. So skilling these folks up is really important. But augmentation has everything to do with context. Because let's shift the context, and I'll continue to pick on criminal justice, where augmentation actually plays out poorly. Risk assessment scoring. Risk assessment scoring is often regarded as one of the important things that we should figure out how to do better. You will read this in all of um, the various uh, fat ML literature. And the idea with risk assessment in the United States is that we should be able to understand when somebody, you know, at different points in the criminal justice system, but let's just say um, whether or not they are um, allowed uh, access to bail, uh, whether or not somebody is a risk to society. And the, the theory or the hypothesis by those who are generally pretty progressive is that we should support judges in helping make certain that people have are more likely to get access to bail, they're more likely to be free. And we generally agree that that's a really positive outcome. So the idea is to use data analytics to try to do this. Okay? Now, of course, we're using that based on really flawed historical data, and we can go into that problem. But we also run into another important problem. It doesn't matter how good or how bad our analytics are and how accurate they are. We are augmenting the decisions of a judge. A judge is supposed to be an independent broker making something. They have a long history of all sorts of abusive practices. Let's even leave that aside. Fundamentally, a judge is either elected or employed. If they are elected or employed, they have a set of motivations because they're going to be politically attacked for a variety of things. They're especially likely to be politically attacked if they go against whatever the recommendation of that algorithm might be. So it doesn't matter. They say, I'm not going to pay attention to it. I ignore it. I, it's not relevant to me. I know what's real. As long as their decisions align with that system, with the recommendation from that risk score, they can sit there and be like, hey, it was, it was the algorithm that did it. right?" And it was a really easy way of justifying it. What happens is that when you put these systems into play, it's not that they intentionally shift judges' perspectives is that judges have less and less incentive to go against the system. They don't even believe themselves to be augmented or affected. This is where we have to acknowledge that no matter how good a technical intervention, no matter how accurate it is, if it is going to be put within a particularly politically fraught or power-laden environment, it can go wrong. And that's where this sort of interesting moment about how much are we predicting what we're doing and how much are we actually starting to shape it. I'm particularly interested in a case that has come out uh, recently. I don't know if any of you have read Automating Inequality, but it's a phenomenal book by um, Virginia Eubanks. And what's most interesting to me is the third case, the Allegheny case that she describes. And the reason why is that by every definition of building a technical system, it was done perfectly. It involved community participation. It involved you know, publicly identifying what the kinds of metrics were going to be used, how the data was going to be used, which features of the data were going to be used. The model was made publicly available. The implementation was first tested within the community and got feedback. There were all of these ways in which we would say that this was a perfect implementation for a social services situation around child abuse. It was fascinating. But it went wrong in practice. Why? Politics, money, all of the sticky social things that no amount of technical accuracy can override. And that's why it's really tricky, because a lot of the ethics and the ethical challenges of these systems are not within the constraints of the technical system, but how the technical system gets deployed. And that's where we have to run into these questions about where we do this and why and how it looks like. It's also why domain matters. So let me example, give you an example of where some of these really good intentions can also sort of have these strange unintended consequences. Madeline Ellish was researching the history of the Federal Aviation Administration um, because she was interested in autopilot. If you haven't been on a plane lately, let me forewarn you that that nice calming voice, who was actually trained to be calming voice, um, that comes on to tell you that everything is safe on the plane, usually a guy, um, that person has not flown a plane in decades. That person is in the cockpit 
basically to babysit the technology that flies on autopilot and to make you feel calmer and happier knowing that somebody is babysitting a technology. Now, autopilot's phenomenal. It has brought tremendous safety to the field of aviation. Right? We did not have, we've had so many fewer crashes as a result of autopilot. It's pretty great. But for that pilot sitting in that cockpit, they haven't actually flown a, pi a, a plane in a long time. They've been actively de-skilled on the job. More importantly, they are expected to jump in when everything goes wrong, right? When the technology fails, when all of the signals are wrong, they're supposed to jump in at the worst possible time, having not had any form of practice. And they're supposed to magically solve the problem. I hate to break it to you, but when that happens, a plane usually crashes, okay? And so what's interesting is those people don't usually live to tell their story. Um, that's because they're actually playing a different role within these socio-technical systems. As Madeline describes it, they are liability sponges. They are taking the responsibility for the whole system. She calls it a moral crumple zone. Crumple zone being that part of your car that receives all the pain on impact. They are sitting there inside that. Now, the reason why this is interesting is that you may have heard of the, um, the landing on the Hudson, some you know, great Tom Hanks movie um, uh, you know, about Sully. The thing that's fascinating about that case, this is the guy who on weekends trained everybody to still learn how to fly in emergencies. He's literally the only person who still really knew how to land without the technical equipment. He lived to tell the story. And it's one of those moments where you're just like, oh, these systems don't always work the way they were intended. By the way, flying is still safe. Um, another type of environment we want to think about is where can we actually build a technical intervention that can, act, that can help us um, undo some of these things. I'm particularly interested by the work of Sorel Friedler, Suresh Venka to um, and their colleagues. Um, and the reason why is that they say that you can actually use information to undo some of the prejudices within systems. And they give an example within the hiring space. So there are a lot of different hiring services out there. If you went to apply for, um, for, to work at Walmart, for example, your application would be sent to a third party firm to then basically decide whether or not you get an interview. There's a lot of problems here. Um, but one of the things that that third party firm is asked to do is say, Give me all of your successful hiring practices, um, dear Walmart, and we will figure out which of these people are most likely to get a, get a, uh, be appropriate for you to hire. Well, unfortunately, what we've learned from just basic um, analysis over that history is that uh, companies like Walmart um, find that their most successful people are people who live closest to them. Um, women don't tend to do very well because they tend to have babies and child care issues. So, you know, let's, let's filter those folks out. Um, when they're close, there's a lot of uh, ideas about who's in the neighborhood and who's not. There's some problems here. So when you basically match against that, you violate every part of the Equal P Employment Opportunity Act. But what Sorrell and Suresh do is they don't say, hey, hands up, it's, it's, it's okay. They say, we can renormalize all of your training data to look for other features that are not proxies for any of those other prejudicial characteristics. That's fascinating. That is a kind of technical intervention where you start to see tremendous opportunity, where you can say, we're going to only work within the characteristics that were described by law, but we're going to make certain that the system cannot reinforce it. And of course, you have to give up a certain level of fidelity within the, um, the analysis, but at the same time, you can actually move things away from long-standing histories when you do so intentionally. Side note, you can't do this without collecting a lot of very sensitive data, and that's a question. What's at stake also it really depends on whether or not you actually have something that you can do with your data analysis into an intervention that will actually make a difference. When I was at Microsoft um, uh, five, six, oh, few too many years ago, six years ago, there was a, a set of technologies put out to try to identify people, or try to identify content that was um, commercial sexual abuse material, basically uh, child pornography. And we started asking ourselves, could we use a lot of these different techniques to identify people who had um, uh, been engaged in um, uh, basically trafficking of, of minors? And in this process, we worked with a lot of partners with different data sets. Um, JP Morgan was one of the best partners we had. And we got pretty darn good at identifying uh, trafficking patterns. Little hint, um, 
uh, nail salons that seem to only operate between the hours of 2 and 4 a.m. and charge $250 a pop, and the person goes back two, three, four days in a row, usually are not giving you a good mani-pedi. Um, and so we started finding ways of, of actually doing some just sort of mainline analytics and finding these patterns. So we started reporting to them to law enforcement. Law enforcement arrested the minors because we actually make it illegal to be a prostitute even if you are a child. So that was a little heartbreaking. Um, we don't actually have a lot of protections in this country around trafficking. We say a lot of things politically that we don't actually do on the ground. And it creates this interesting moral conundrum when you're doing data analytics. What does it mean when you get good at your analysis, but the people who take that analysis aren't going to do what you hope they would do with it? We just stopped doing the analysis. I still struggle morally and ethically with that on a regular basis. But how do we deal with that where we actually have to realize that the pipeline goes beyond us? And how do we deal when the same piece of technology can actually be inverted to do good or bad depending on who's actually um, controlling it? So scheduling software is now one of those features that's used in much of retail. Um, for those who aren't familiar, this basically tries to allocate um, talent, uh, workers, to stores um, uh, within a particular set of constraints. Almost all retail uses it to make certain that no one gets over 32 hours, right, so that they don't actually get benefits. Um, and basically, it's always designed to benefit the employer. Uh, it doesn't have to be. Actually, you can design these systems to maximize the benefit for the worker. But who is actually paying for that software? Who's actually um, you know, tweaking the, the features sort of really matters. I say this because it's an interesting and hard challenge to sort of hold a line, not just about doing the technical work, but about understanding its implementation. So we're going to come back to a set, you know, an issue of accountability, and I'm going to go fast through this, because what I wanted to make clear through those examples is that power matters. And any time we do data analytics, any time we implement these systems, it is not just about the decisions that we make at the technical front, but it is the power of the system.